morning and happy Sabbath. Oh, we could do better than that. Happy Sabbath. <laughs> All right, <laughs> that's better. Okay, it's, I'm very grateful to be back here. I haven't been here in a while, and this is a special blessing for me. Um, bear with me a minute while I set up my laptop. Give me just a second here, and as I'm doing that, I just want to mention that what I'm going to share today, this message, is actually part of a series that I started a couple of years ago. And normally I like to speak on present truth, and that is what's happening around us and how that relates to Bible prophecy. In a sense, you could say some of this is, but more importantly, this is about character. It's about what we need to do to truly represent Christ to others. And, and I think right now, with what's happening around us, that is the single most important thing. We could talk a blue streak. We can do all these wonderful things. We can share. We can hand out literature. We could do all of that. But if we're not illustrating with our own behavior how our Lord and Savior is, we've lost. And we've not only lost ourselves, we've lost others. So really, that's what it's about today, about a very important subject of forgiveness. And as I said, this part of a series that I called The Road to Forgiveness, there may be a little bit of rehash in this. Uh, I don't know if you remember, because it was a couple of years ago. Uh, but this will be a little bit different today. And some things that I think really help to drive the point home. And before I have prayer, one thing I do want to share, and this is something that Susan and I were looking at the other day in our devotional, and it's what inspired doing this message today. And this is from Steps to Christ. It's page 97. And it says, When we come to ask mercy and blessings from God, we should have a spirit of love and forgiveness in our own hearts. How can we pray, forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors? and yet indulge an unforgiving spirit. If we expect our own prayers to be heard, we must forgive others in the same, in the same manner and to the same extent as we hope to be forgiven. I think that says it all right there, very, very uh, important. And I also think along the lines of that, how far are we willing to go, not only to forgive ourselves, but to forgive others. Very, very important. And that's what the subject is today. So let me make sure I've got power here on this laptop. And uh, hopefully, uh, if you're all seeing something on the screen. If it'll let me in. Well, it would be helpful if it did. There we go. And again, the title of this message is The Road to Forgiveness. And it is, there's a long road to being able not only to forgive, whoops, I'm back here, to forgive others, but there's a method and there's a process in doing that. It doesn't just come automatically, and I think a lot of us have a hard time with that. In fact, I'll get to that in a minute. But I'm going to take this opportunity to have a word of prayer, and I'm going to get on my knees. And for those who'd like to join me, you're more than welcome. Our loving Heavenly Father, dear Lord, we are such frail and helpless human beings, helpless because we could do nothing without you. And Lord, we all have struggles. Even as I speak right now, I know there are those here in this church family and others and all around us in, in our church family worldwide that are having struggles of one kind or another. Maybe it's with unforgiveness, certainly one of those things, especially as we look around at the things happening in this world, we know that there's not a lot of time left to get things right, and I speak that of myself too. Each one of us should be taking this time to reflect on where we really are. Are we just going through the ceremonies, the rituals? Are we just speaking the words? Or are they really heartfelt? And are we ready to sacrifice all for the kingdom? Lord, please help us today as uh, I speak. Please place the words in my mouth that this not be my idea, but let it come from on high. 
And I just pray that we'll all be convicted of these things so that when we go out into this world, whether it's with our family, our friends, our neighbors, that we will truly reflect your character in all that we do. We thank you. We praise you. And in Jesus' holy and precious and marvelous name, we pray. And for his sake, amen. All right, the road to forgiveness. And uh, what really prompted this is that, you know, there really is a paradox, you know, in the church, not this church in particular, but the entire church, and probably other churches as well. You know, people profess not just to be Christians, but they profess to be Seventh-day Adventist Christians. And as Seventh-day Adventists, you know, we should know the truth, amen? We study our Bibles, theoretically, we read Spirit of Prophecy. We spend time in, in uh, prayer meetings and so forth. So out of that, we should gain a knowledge and an understanding of what the truth is. But the question about all of it is, do we practice it? Do we actually live up to that truth? I just realize, bear with me for a second here, I didn't connect my little clicker. If I walk around, it's not going to do what I want it to. <laughs> There's always with the technology something that gets forgotten. Okay, hopefully this will work. Yep, it does. Ever hear the expression the proof is in the pudding? You know where that does anyone know where that came from? It's actually derived from a proverb. Uh, that was around in 1605. And the actual proverb was, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. And what does that mean, anyway? It means it doesn't matter how fancy the decoration is or how nice the presentation is of that dish, right? It doesn't matter. It's what it tastes like. It's how good it tastes. So we can have, you know, this beautiful, let me use another analogy. We have this beautiful car. If anyone's in the cars, I'm not. I'm not in the material, the material world, but some people love their cars. And you see this beautiful Porsche, right? A brand new, sparkling vehicle. But then you open the hood, and there's nothing under it. Is that car of any use? No, not at all. So that's the whole point. The test of whether or not someone is truly converted, truly loves the Lord, and is truly practicing what God asks us all to do, is in their demeanor, their behavior, their outward behavior, how they treat others. Very, very important. <clears throat> this is from medical ministry, excuse me. Our work is to strive to attain in our sphere of action the perfection that Christ in his life on the earth attained in every phase of character. He is our example. In all things, we are to strive to honor God and character. In failing day by day so far short, or falling so far short of the divine requirements, we are endangering our soul's salvation. We need to understand and appreciate the privilege with which Christ invests us and to show our determination to reach the highest standard. We are to be wholly dependent on the power that he has promised to give us. Just before making this requirement, the Savior said to his disciples, love your enemies, bless them that curse you. We are to love our enemies with the same love that Christ manifested toward his enemies by giving his life to save them. Many may say, and this really reson should resonate with us, this is a hard commandment, for I want to keep just as far as I can from my enemies. How many feel that way? Someone's really hurt you. You don't like them. You don't want to keep your distance. You don't want to get involved with those people, right? But acting in accordance with your own inclination would not be carrying out the principles that our Savior has given. Do good, he says, to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. This scripture illustrates one phase of Christian perfection. While we were yet enemies of God, Christ gave his life for us. We're to follow his example. Couldn't be more true. Couldn't be more well said. 
so what I want to do now is I want to talk about some real life examples. Now we could talk about the biblical examples. We should all know them. If you think of, for example, Stephen in Acts chapter 7 when he was stoned. What did he say when he was on his, kneel, on his knees, uh, when he was kneeling? He, he, he was going to die, right? What did he say? He said, lay not this sin to their charge. Isn't that incredible? I mean, here he's about to lose his life. They stoned him. For, because why? Because he spoke the truth. He spoke the truth. He was going to die, but he said yet at that point, forgive them. Forgive them. But, you know, we look at these things sometimes and say, well, that, you know, Scripture, and we've heard these things. Oops, excuse me. Very sensitive mic. We've heard these things many, many times in our time in the church. But my question, and I ask this of myself too, does it really sink in? Do we have real life examples that illustrate something even far beyond that? Are there? And indeed there are, and I want to share a few of those that I think are really key. How many of you remember or know Corey Ten Boom? Very significant story. She was a Holocaust survivor, and what she went through, now I don't know how many of you remember or knew or have heard all of the things that happened in the Holocaust. Now I know all too well because I grew up in a Jewish family and we heard all the stories and I saw the newspaper clippings that my dad had saved. And it was a horrible, horrible ordeal for a lot of people beyond anything that any of us in here can imagine right now. No exaggeration. But I want to read to you what she went through. And this is from a book. Uh, it's an excerpt, actually, from, from Seven Women and the Secret of Their Greatness. It's by Eric Metaxas. And this is about Corey Ten Boom. And I just want to share this because I think it helps to highlight one particular incident that happened with her that I, I know when I read this, I'm like, could I do this? Could I do it? said, Corey was put to the test in 1947 while speaking in a Munich church. At the close of the service, a balding man in a gray overcoat stepped forward to greet her. Corey froze. She knew this man well. He'd, be one of, he'd been one of the most vicious guards at Ravensbrück, one who had mocked the women prisoners as they showered. It came back with a rush, she wrote. The huge room with its harsh overhead lights, the pathetic pile of dresses and shoes in the center of the floor, the shame of walking naked past this man. And now he was pushing his hand out to shake hers, saying, a fine message, Fraulein. How good it is to know that, as you say, all our sins are at the bottom of the sea. And I, who had spoken so glibly of forgiveness, fumbled in my pocketbook rather than take that hand. He would not remember me, of course. How could he remember one prisoner among those thousands of women? But I remembered him and the leather crop swinging from his belt. I was face to face with one of my captors, and my blood seemed to freeze. You mentioned Ravensbrook in your talk, he was saying. I was a guard there, but since that time, he went on, I have become a Christian. I know that God has forgiven me for the cruel things I did there. But I would like to hear it from your lips as well, Fraulein. Again, the hand came out. Will you forgive me? Will you forgive me? And I stood there. I, whose sins had again and again to be forgiven and could not forgive. Betsy had died in that place, referring to her sister. Could he erase her slow, terrible death simply for the asking? The soldier stood there expectantly, waiting for Corey to shake his hand. She wrestled with the most difficult thing. She said, it's the most difficult thing I had ever to do, for I had to do it. I knew that. The message that God forgives has a prior condition, that we forgive those who have injured us. Standing there before the former SS man, Corey remembered that forgiveness is an act of the will, not an emotion. I want you to remember that. That's very important. I'll share more about that. Jesus, help me, she prayed. I can't lift my hand. I can do that. I, I can try to do that. I could do that much. You supply the feeling. Corey thrust her hand out. And she said, as I did, 
an incredible thing took place. The current started in my shoulder, raced down my arm, sprang into our joined hands, and then this healing warmth seemed to flood my whole being, bringing tears to my eyes. I forgive you, brother, I cried with all my heart. For a long moment, we grasped each other's hands, the former God and the former prisoner, and I had never known God's love so intensely as I did then. But even so, I realized it was not my love. I had tried and did not have the power. It was the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'll tell you, that moved me when I heard that because, you know, you think about your own life and how many times people have done things to harm you. We're talking about minor things. Somebody just, a little slight they gave. Maybe a word they said that they, they didn't mean it. Maybe they said something to you, they berated you in some way, and you're walking around. We have, I know specifically of people, I won't, obviously won't mention names, in some of our own churches, even here locally, that are not speaking to others, because, and years have gone by simply because of something they said. I'm not exaggerating that. I'm not, no reflection on anyone here, but it's something for all of us to think about. It's from Matthew 5, verses 43 to 48. Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. And here it is. This is what we were reading earlier from Spirit of Prophecy. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his sun to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love them which love you, and here's the rest of it, and this is important, if you love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? And if you salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans so? Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which in heaven is perfect. Now the Greek word for perfect is teleos. It's a state of completeness, maturity, established in one's growth. It doesn't mean, you know, you're absolutely perfect, you're without flaw. It means you're growing in grace. You're growing in your walk with Christ. You're becoming more mature as a Christian. It doesn't mean without a flaw. This is from the book of education. We think with horror. I love this quote, and I've used it before in other messages. We think with horror of the cannibal who feasts on the still warm and trembling flesh of his victim. But are the results of even this practice more terrible than are the agony and ruin caused by misrepresenting motive, blackening reputation, dissecting character? Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Couldn't be more true. The words we speak are profound. You know, just think of how they affect our children, for example. It's a subject I like to talk about a lot, how we need to set an example for our kids. That's why Susan and I have been involved, among other things, in education for many years. You know, what we do for our children is vital because it's going to teach them what they should know. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. That's a very important concept. And how we act is going to be a perfect example of that. And what we say, the words we speak, are going to make a difference. You know, sometimes I cringe when I see a parent with a child yelling at that child, you stupid child, you stupid, you're stupid. Well, what is, how's that child, what's going to happen to that child? That's going to get internalized. Well, it's the same with us as adults. We haven't changed that much. We're still going to be affected by what people say. But talking about forgiving others, talking about finding it in your heart to let go, even though you've been totally persecuted. I want to give you another example. Here's a man who was on death row for 30 years. He was wrongfully convicted, totally innocent of the crime with which he was charged. What happened with him? I want to share this. I'm going to read this little bit of a narrative about Anthony Ray Hinton, who spent three decades on Alabama's death row for crimes he didn't commit. In 1985, he was convicted of the murder of two restaurant workers in Birmingham. 30 years later, his conviction was overturned and he walked free. In a new book, The Sun Shines, How I Found Life and Freedom on Death, Death Row, Hinton shares how his faith sustained him as he waited to die in prison. Was his faith 
that kept him going, even under incredibly difficult circumstances, <clears throat> and how it helped him also to forgive those who wrongfully prosecuted him. Evidence used to convict Hinton was a set of bullets recovered from the crime scene. Investigators said the bullets matched the gun found at Hinton's mother's home, though ballistic testing was never performed on the gun. There was discrimination involved in this case, too. It's a long story, which I can't cover the whole thing, but I'm reading you the key pieces of this. The Equal Justice Initiative, which works to clear wrongfully convicted people, worked on Hinton's case for 16 years. After a new trial, it was discovered that the bullets did not match. They never matched right from the beginning. On April 3rd, 2015, the Supreme Court unanimously overturned his conviction and the state dropped all charges. Hinton was released from prison. All those snapping cameras and, and all that, I want you to know there is a God. That was his quote to all the media. There is a God. Hinton told reporters the day he walked free. That's what he said. He also now, to this day, is involved in helping other inmates who have been wrongfully accused, and not just helping them with their case, but helping them to find the Lord. Amen. What, a, what an incredible story. No, I'm not advancing here for some reason. Here we go. Here's another one. This is another man who served 30 years in prison. Isn't that interesting? Two, and there were more. You know, I was involved in prison ministry for a while, and I came across a lot of, a lot of men that were, in, that were incarcerated and really were innocent. It does happen. But that's just another one. I won't get into that one right now in the interest of time. This is from Christian Education. The teacher from heaven, no less a personage than the Son of God, came to earth to reveal the character of the Father to men that they might worship him in spirit and in truth. Christ revealed to men the fact that the strictest adherence to ceremony and form would not save them. Like I said, we could do all the ceremonies we like. That isn't going to mean anything if it's not in here. It's got to be in our hearts, first and foremost. For the kingdom of God was spiritual in its nature. He taught them honesty, forbearance, mercy, and compassion, enjoining upon them to love not only those who love them, but those who hated them, who treated them despitefully. In this, he was revealing to them the character of the Father, who is long-suffering, merciful, and gracious, slow to anger, and full of goodness and truth. Those who accepted his teaching were under the guardian care of angels, who were commissioned to strengthen, to enlighten, that the truth might renew and sanctify the soul. Really incredible. I'm going to get now to one of the most graphic examples in recent history. I know there are many, many of them, and this one just really came up in my mind. I'm going to share this one, and, and I have to say it's a bit grisly. I'm going to preface it with that. Here's a guy, Charles Carl Roberts. This was a West Nickel Mines school shooting. It's an Amish school. This happened back... Uh, uh, quite a few years ago, and I will read you the specifics. It was in 2006. Basically, he shot eight of ten girls in the school before dying by suicide in the schoolhouse. Now, I know we hear a lot about school shootings today, and you know I think we've become almost a little bit desensitized in some ways because we hear this news all the time. But this story was particularly, not just particularly heinous in what he did, but what was more important is what grew out of that. That's what I want to bring out today. So I'm going to share this narrative about that. <clears throat> On October 2, 2006, a shooting occurred at the West Nickel Mine School, an Amish one-room schoolhouse in the Old Order Amish community of Nickel Mines, a village in Bart Township, Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. Roberts backed a pickup truck to the front of the Amish schoolhouse and entered it at approximately 10.25 a.m. Now, again, I want to preface this by saying some of this is pretty gruesome. Be aware of that. Shortly after the children had returned from recess, he asked the teacher, Emma, Emma May Zook, and the students if they had seen a missing clevis pin on the road. Survivors said he mumbled his words and did not make direct eye contact. After they denied seeing the pin, he left to his truck and re-entered holding a Springfield Armory XD 9mm handgun. He ordered the boys to help him carry items into the classroom from the truck. 
Zook and her mother, who was visiting, took the opportunity to escape and run toward a nearby farm for help. Robert saw them leave and ordered one of the boys to stop them, threatening to shoot everyone if they got away. They reached the farm where, the, where they asked Amos Smoker to call 911. Meanwhile, the boys carried in lumber, a shotgun, a stun gun, wires, chains, nails, tools, a small bag, and a wooden board with multiple sets of metal eye hooks. The bag held a change of clothes, toilet paper, candles, and flexible plastic ties. Using wooden boards, Roberts barricaded the front door. Roberts ordered the girls to line up against the chalkboard. One girl, nine-year-old Emma Fisher, escaped without her older sister. At approximately 11.07 a.m., Roberts began shooting the victims. State troopers immediately approached. As the first trooper in line reached the window, the shooting abruptly stopped. Roberts had committed suicide. During the shooting, he fired at least 13 rounds from his pistol initially. After the police entered the schoolhouse, all of the wounded girls were taken to hospitals. Two had died at the schoolhouse. One was pronounced dead on arrival at Lancaster General Hospital, and two sisters survived until the early hours of October 3rd when they were taken off life support. The surviving victims of the immediate attack were brought to Lancaster General Hospital, stabilized, and then transferred to hospitals with pediatric trauma care. Reports stated that most of the girls were shot execution style in the back of the head. Pennsylvania State Police Commissioner Jeffrey Miller said Robert shot his victims in the head at close range with 17 or 18 shots fired in all including the one he used to take his own life as police stormed into the school by breaking through the window glass. Uh, Janice uh, Bollinger, deputy coroner in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, counted at least a dozen shotgun pellet inflicted wounds in one child alone before asking her colleague to take over and continue for her. She couldn't even go on with her job. On the day of the shooting, a grandfather and here it is. This is the part I want to share and really bring this out because, I, you know, as we all hear this, I know as a parent, as someone working with children for many years, the idea of someone doing this to one of our children, especially your own children, can you imagine what you'd be feeling, truly what you would be feeling? I'm going to, here's the leading question. Could you forgive that person? Could you forgive that person? Let's see what happened with this story. On the day of the shooting, a grandfather of one of the murdered Amish girls was heard warning some young relatives not to hate the killer, saying, we must not think evil of this man. Another Amish father no noted he had a mother and a wife and a soul, and now he's standing before a just God. Now, they might not have gotten that part right, but nonetheless, you get the point. Jack Meyer, a member of the Brethren uh, community living near the Amish in Lancaster County, explained, I don't think there's anybody here that wants to do anything but forgive and not only reach out to those who have suffered a loss in that way, but to reach out to the family of the man who committed these acts. Several of the Amish community comforted the family of the shooter, and the level of forgiveness and understanding was echoed all over the national media. It was a big story. Everyone heard about this because it was so incredible that it was such a gruesome crime that all the people involved, the families of these kids, were able to forgive this man and comfort the family. What a statement that was for what Christ is telling all of us. Amen? <clears throat> it, was, it was said that while most of Robert's own family, and this is interesting, this, this is part of it, I, I don't even need to read that. His own family, much of his own family, didn't attend the funeral, his funeral. But guess who did? The Amish families. They were there to support his family members. Praise God that people can find in themselves to have such sense of forgiveness. And here, what about us? Like I said, we have instances where good grief, we have meetings with each other, and someone says something we don't like, and we jump all over them. And then we don't, we don't treat them well. We, we, we don't forgive them for the things that they may have done or said. What example does that give to others? That's where the rubber meets the road. It's not just knowing these things as Christians. 
but it's actually living them and practicing them. That's what makes all the difference. So one of the articles about the school shooting in Pennsylvania was all over the national media talking about what happened. And then this one was a recent article recapping what happened back years ago, saying their compassion is unending. School shooter's wife relives moment the family of Amish girls her husband killed came to offer her love and forgiveness. It's amazing. And it says on here, Mary Monville was married to Charles Roberts, 32, when he opened fire. It gives the background. It says he killed five girls aged 6 to 13 and injured five more. Monville has since remarried and written a book on the tragedy. So this is a story that has resonated, has gone around the world, and people would say, how did, how did they forgive? How did they forgive that man and, his, and, and were there to comfort his family? This is from Councils to Parents, Teachers, and Students. Christ presented to men that which was entirely contrary to the representations of the enemy in regard to the character of God. Let me just comment on that. I had someone recently tell me, you know, uh, we had something happen actually in our own family where someone had done something, you know, that was not right, not very, very good, and hurt, hurt us, hurt a lot of other people. Uh, and we actually had a friend say, how could you forgive him? You, you, I would never forgive I would never speak to him again. I would never forgive him for that. And, and that is an attitude that does come across quite frequently in a lot of people, including many in our church. Oh, I can't forgive them. What, is, what are we supposed to do? And sought to impress upon men the love of the Father, who so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but everlasting life. There's the example. That's the most extreme example. And that's one for all of us. So what about us? Are we ready to forgive those who have just merely slighted us? Are we, are we prepared to do that? Can we do it and can we truly mean it? And the test of whether someone is truly converted is their demeanor. And demeanor, as I said earlier, same thing. <laughs> it's from the signs of the times. How many have in the past year, I, I like this, this is a very good and very telling quote from Ellen White. How many have in the past year cherished heart burnings and bitterness toward their brethren and sisters in the church? How many have thought and spoken unkindly of those who, like themselves, profess to be followers of Jesus? We may think we had an excuse for this, but is there any provocation of sufficient weight to excuse us in harboring unkindness and malice in our hearts, said Jesus, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. If we do not in our daily life exemplify these principles, we cannot be accepted before God. That's pretty strong language. We must earnestly seek his grace to kill every fiber of the root of bitterness and must let the love of Jesus take possession of our souls and reveal itself in our words and works or we are not of Christ but of the wicked one. Wow, that's pretty strong language. It really is. You know, the Bible does provide us with a mechanism for settling differences when we have an issue with, with when someone has hurt us, right? Amen? And I'm going to go through this very quickly because I, we, I know we're all aware of these, these verses, but again, the question is, do we practice them? Do we practice these principles? It's from Matthew 18, 15 through 17. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. So there is a process, but that doesn't mean if we take something to the church, if all else has failed, that doesn't mean we broadcast it on the local television station. And Ellen White talks about that. I'm going to share that. This is from Desire of Ages. But it is to the wrongdoer himself that we are to present the wrong. 
In other words, don't go around talking to everybody else, right? Saying, oh, so-and-so did this. Boy, I can't believe they did that. We are not to make it a matter of comment and criticism among ourselves, nor even after it is told to the church are we at liberty to repeat it to others. A knowledge of the faults of Christians will be, will be only a cause of stumbling to the unbelieving world. Isn't that true? You know, if we put on such a show like that, people say, what kind of, is that what Christianity is all about? I don't want that. And by dwelling upon these things, we ourselves can receive only harm. For it is by beholding that we become changed. Amen? While we seek to correct the errors of a brother, the Spirit of Christ will lead us to shield him as far as possible from the criticism of even his own brethren, and how much more from the censure of the unbelieving world. We ourselves are erring, all of us, and need Christ's pity and forgiveness. And just as we wish him to deal with us, he bids us deal with one another. And there's one more thing I want to share and get into one other aspect of this because I think it's really important. Uh, I'm going to skip over these verses here and it's about the uh, servant that basically is forgiven of his debt <clears throat> and then he goes out, and I'm sure you all remember this. If you, you could look it up, Matthew 18, verses 23 to 35, I suggest you look at that. In the interest of time, I'm going to skip over that because the point of it is that what happened with him after he was forgiven by his master of his debt, which was considerable, what did he do? He went out to those who owed him something and shook them up and grabbed them by the throat and said, pay me now or, or else. What kind of example is that? And of course, in the end, I'll read the last verse, the last two verses, 34 and 35. And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. We need to forgive people for the things that they do to hurt us. And this is from the Review and Herald. We must forgive those who trespass against us if we would obtain pardon and grace when we approach the mercy seat. Mercy and love must be cherished by all who would be followers of Jesus. He, Jesus, enforced the duty of forgiveness by the parable of the two debtors. So again, very important, but what happens? What happens if we harbor unforgiveness? What happens if it builds up? And what happens when you do that? I mean, how many of us have been through this and we think on it and think on it and we build up all this judgment and eventually you get to the point of actually hating that person, that happens, and then anger wells up and what are the consequences of that? And this is the reason why, why we were given these principles in, in the Bible originally, because we don't want that to happen. What does happen? Let's take a look at what Scripture tells us on this. This is from Matthew 5, verses 21 to 24. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill. And whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whomsoever shall say, Thou fool, shall, shall be in danger of hellfire. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest thy brother hath aught against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. So do we have counsel in Scripture on how to handle instances where either someone has something against us and we need to go try to work it out with them? And, 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 is, and on, in the inverse, if we have issues with somebody, that we can work that out and go talk to them? We go talk to them directly instead of going around every which direction? So, you know, again, what if, what if we don't practice it? Where does it lead? Now, this is one article I'm going to show you that this was, I, I did this a couple of years ago. It's one from then because it was such a striking example. A church lady gets life for killing. This woman got really jealous because the church was helping her out financially, and she didn't, she didn't, another woman financially, she didn't like that, and the pastor was also trying to help that other woman. She became jealous of that, came in and shot the woman in the church, got life imprisonment. Are there consequences to building up this kind of angst, anger, and frustration with people? Sure there are. Another one. 
Detroit church erupts into brawl as protesters interrupt to slam wealthy pastors' lavish lifestyles. There's actually a brawl in the church over the pastor, the way he lived. An investigation underway after brawl breaks out at Norristown Church Carnival. The people having a good time or whatever, uh, you know, whatever you want to look at that as, and a fight breaks out. <clears throat> Fist fight during church services, over 50 congregants fight. I think some people's jaws were broken as well. Uh, pastor's wife and mistress fight at communion day service in church. <laughs> Look, I, I'm sorry. I, I, I know we, we kind of chuckle at this. You, you can't make this stuff up. You know, but we talk about extreme cases. Come on. This one's good. In, this is from ABC News. In Jesus' name, throw punches. Fight church. Christian ministries believe in fight clubs. So isn't that something? This is another one from CBS News. Some of these are recent. Some of these are a few years ago. Dozens of police break a brawl at North Carolina church. Dozens of police. Took a bunch of police to do that. Saving seats at a Mormon church in Plain City leads to assault, arrest. Uh, violent fistfight over church seat lands Utah man in jail. That's another article about that. Uh, didn't like, get fight over a seat, winds up in jail. Anyway, you get the point. I, I mean, again, we could laugh at some of this and say, yeah, well, I would never do that. Really? Can it get to the point with any of us where eventually we just have so much anger towards somebody because we just can't deal with them anymore and the hatred builds? Is it possible that we could literally lose our temper to that extent? It's happened. It happens. This is from Manuscript Releases, Volume 3. We are forming characters for heaven. No character can be complete without trial and suffering. We must be tested. We must be tried. Christ bore the test of character in our behalf that we might bear this test in our own behalf through the divine strength he has brought to us. Christ is our example in patience, in forbearance, in meekness, and lowliness of mind. He was at variance and at war with the whole ungodly world. Yet he did not give way to passion and violence manifested in words and actions. Although receiving shameful abuse in return for good works, he was afflicted, he was rejected, and despitefully treated, yet he retaliated not. He possessed self-control, dignity, and majesty. He suffered with calmness and for abuse gave only compassion, pity, and love. Amen. And this is, uh, goes on. Imitate your Redeemer in these things. That's the, those are the words to us. Imitate your Redeemer in these things. Do not get excited when things go wrong. Do not let self arise and lose your self-control because you fancy things are not as they should be. Because others are wrong is no excuse for you to do wrong. Two wrongs will not make one right. I remember my mom saying that to me when I was a kid. I don't know how many times. Two wrongs don't make a right. And it's true. You have victories to gain in order to overcome as Christ overcame. I'm going to be wrapping this up here pretty quickly. 1 Peter 1, 7. This is from 1 Peter 1, verse 7 that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. And Ephesians 5.27, the Bible says, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. And finally, from Christ's object lessons, Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his church. When the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. It is the privilege of every Christian not only to look for, not only to look for but to hasten the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. For all who profess his name bearing fruit to his glory, how quickly the whole world would be sown with the seed of the gospel. Quickly the last great harvest would be ripened and Christ would come to gather the precious grain. So I urge everyone here seriously, and, and, and again, these are not just words. I didn't share this at the outset, 
but I'm dealing with some health issues that uh, are difficult right now. And sometimes I don't have a lot of energy, a lot of strength. And quite frankly, I didn't even think I could be here today to do this. So when I do speak, wherever it may be, whatever church it's at, wherever I go, I'm doing it because I know the Lord wants a message out. And whether it means even giving up my, my health, my, even my life, I'm that convicted to do it. That's why I'm here. And this message of all, even though, again, I like, as I said, to talk about present truth, uh, that's very important uh, to be able to share where we are in time and how these things link back to Bible prophecy. That's my favorite subject, quite frankly, because that's where we're at. So you go back and read Matthew 24. But that being said, these principles are what's going to take us to the kingdom, not knowing all the details about where we are in time. Important, yes, and we need to know those things, but those aren't going to change our character. That's what we need to work on if we're going to be right with the Lord and be where we need to be. And that goes to every level of detail. Meetings at our churches, board meetings, potlucks, whatever. Think about, each one of us should think about what we're saying to the other person. Always, always. Never do something that would be hurtful because we want to treat them as we would want to be treated. Amen? So with that, I have a closing prayer. I'm get on my knees. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I know that myself, people I know, people closest to me, look, we've all been guilty of this at one time or another, of harboring unforgiveness. And I just pray that for everyone here, and for all of our loved ones, our families, and all those we reach, that they will take, take these words to heart that you've given us. That we needn't be this way. We needn't do things to be offensive to others or to hurt them, but to always reflect the love that you have shown for us. After all, we are all sinners and fallen short of the glory. Lord, please help us with that. Help us not to lose our, our balance, to lose our, our sense of, of what's right and wrong. Please be with each one of us, especially as we go today and, and finish out this Sabbath day. Let us remember these words. Let them resound in our minds that forgiveness is such a key component of our walk with you. We thank you, Lord. We praise you for all these things. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.